Welcome to the Technological Companion on Maximum A Posteriori Estimation in Bayesian Learning. In this Technological Companion tutorial, we'll work through several MATLAB Live scripts that implement both map estimation and Bayesian learning as techniques for parameter estimation of some given probability distributions. However, they're going to have some added features that we didn't see in our previous techniques for parameter estimation. Specifically, map estimation and Bayesian learning are going to include some metrics for establishing both accuracy and confidence in our estimates. Our first maximum a posteriori or map estimation example is going to be tied to the binomial distribution. We believe that the data set x equals the array containing the values 13, 10, 10, and 17 is binomially distributed with a value of n equals 20 trials. However, the parameter p, or the probability of observing a preferred outcome on any one Bernoulli trial, is unknown. In order to estimate p, we're going to begin by finding the maximum likelihood estimate based on our data set. We'll do that using just the MATLAB's built-in MLE function that we've already used for parameter estimation several times now. So we apply the MLE function to our data set X, we specify that the distribution that we're working with is binomial, and we state that the number of trials for that distribution are known to be n, which is 20. So if we run that block of code, we'll see that the maximum likelihood estimate for our unknown parameter of p is 0.625. Now that, that's a perfectly adequate place to stop at this point, but we're going to try to refine that estimate. And maximum a posteriori estimation is a tool that we can use for that. And so the way that we're going to do that is that we're going to define a prior distribution for our unknown parameter p. We're going to treat p as a random variable. And we're going to assume that it's distributed by a beta distribution. Now a beta distribution is just a generic bell-shaped curve, bell-shaped distribution that describes a random variable that ranges from 0 to 1. And for different input parameters, the beta distribution can be shaped symmetrically, asymmetrically, pretty much whatever you want over that interval. And so we're going to aim to parameterize our beta prior so that it takes on a mean that's equal to our maximum likelihood estimate. And then it has a standard deviation of 0 0.2, and that value isn't unique or special in any way. It's just it's a reasonably large value for a standard deviation that is a way of stating that 0 0.625 is basically our estimate for p, but we're not overly confident in that estimate. We're not real certain that it's correct. So we're establishing a pretty wide margin of error around that value. So the way to to do that is to recognize that the beta distribution depends on two parameters, alpha and beta. And those two parameters can be expressed in terms of the known mean and standard deviation that you're shooting for. And that is this pair of formulas right here. So if we specify the mean to be our maximum likelihood estimate and sigma to be 0.2, then these formulas will collect or calculate the correct values of alpha and beta, which we can then in turn parameterize our beta distribution prior with. And I want to plot that prior so that we have a sense of what it looks like and see that it actually represents the idea that the true value of p ought to be roughly around 0 0.625, but there's a wide degree of variation around it. So in order to plot it, I create a finely meshed vector of values ranging from 0 to 1 for my values of p. I define the prior distribution beta to pdf in terms of those p values, and then I plot one against the other. So if we run that block of code, then ultimately we see our, our beta prior. You can see it's a very broad 
very wide bell-shaped curve. It is asymmetric because the peak is over here to the right of the midpoint at 0 0.5. It's, the peak is kind of towards the 0 0.6, 0 0.7 range. So that, that's a fairly broad beta prior that reflects that we think our true value of p is somewhere in the vicinity of this peak, but there's a lot of variability around that assumption. So how do we reduce that variability? And that's, that's where map estimation comes in, or maximum a posteriori estimation comes in. We have to use Bayes' theorem to come up with a posterior distribution that is somehow going to be more tightly controlled, less variable, than our prior distribution is to begin with. Okay. And so the process that we're going to go through is we're going to create a likelihood function for our data. This is just the binomial distribution evaluated at each of our data points, placed into a product, and allowed to range over all possible values of p from 0 to 1. Now if we're going to form the marginal probability by using the law of total probability, what we have to do is, since our prior distribution and our likelihood function of our data both depend on on um, p, which is a continuous random variable, we have to multiply those together. And then rather than sum them all over all values of p, we've got to integrate them over all values of p. And MATLAB's built-in function traps. It's named that because it's tied to the trapezoidal rule for numerical integration. It comes up with an approximate integral over, over that function of the, the prior probability times the the uh, likelihood function. And that's what's going to give us our marginal probability. Finally, we've got to construct the function that we need to maximize, and that's the posterior probability. And so that is going to be the likelihood function times the prior divided by the marginal probability. We can plot that, and we'll see that it looks like less of a broad curve than this one, and we'll see also that its, its peak might shift around a little bit. So we'll run this section and see how it turns out. So now we've got a new, new plot that compares the posterior probability, a tall and sharp narrow peak clustered around, again, the 0 0.6 range compared to this prior probability that was much broader, representing a much greater degree of uncertainty. So we could stop at that point and say that, you know, the mean of this distribution or the mode or some other measure based off of that distribution is going to be our estimate for the, um, the mode is typically going to be it because we maximize that function in order to find the estimate for our our unknown parameter p. In fact, we can do that in our next block of code. We can, just like we would have done in maximum likelihood estimation by hand where we maximized the likelihood function, we can maximize the posterior probability by hand. So if we try to figure out where the peak is, it's where I've drawn this vertical line, and it turns out that it's telling me that the probability should be 0 0.62763 based on our refined understanding of where that parameter should be based off of our collection of data. One of the nice things about map estimation is that it can be iterated if you wish to go out and collect more data. So let's imagine that we just did that. We'll go out and collect four more observations of our random variable x and they happen to be 12, 14, 9, and 14. Well, all we have to do in order to get an even more refined estimate for our unknown parameter p is to update the prior probability to our old posterior probability. So we're going to replace this blue curve with this orange curve in terms of what plays the role of our prior. And then we're going to go through our entire algorithm again. We'll compute a new likelihood function using the new data, 
will compute the new marginal probability by integrating the likelihood function times our new prior. And then we'll use Bayes' theorem to compute the new posterior probability, and then plot it. And when we do that, this purple graph is even taller and steeper compared to the orange graph than the orange graph was compared to the blue graph. So we've got a new location of our peak, and we've got an even greater degree of certainty that that location is correct. And we can see that, we can visualize that, because our posterior probability, this purple graph, is even taller and narrower than previous iterations in this process. If I wanted to know what my actual estimate is, all I've got to do is locate the p-value that corresponds to that purple peak. So if I run my last section, we'll see that that new estimate corresponds to where this green line intersects the x-axis. It's a little bit lower. It is 0 0.62062. Well, that's the process of map estimation in a nutshell. And as long as you're willing to continue collecting data, then this process can go on indefinitely. All you have to do is update your prior probability to be the old posterior probability and calculate a new likelihood function based upon your new data set and then follow through the rest of the algorithm as before. You can do that over and over again until you basically you get tired of it or you get a posterior probability distribution that is tall and narrow enough located, uh, you know, centered around um, the, the, the peak that is going to be your estimate. So that's how map estimation works. Map estimation can be applied to most of the probability distributions that we work with. It's not limited to being used only with the binomial distribution. In this example, we'll apply it to the Poisson distribution. So it's believed that the data set x equal the array 80, 92, 87, 80, or 95, and 97 is distributed by the Poisson distribution with an unknown parameter of lambda. First, we establish the maximum likelihood estimate for lambda so that we'll have a starting point for our map iteration. So we'll use, as before, the maximum likelihood estimation, or MLE function, apply it to our data set x, and then specify that the distribution we're working with is Poisson. So if we run our block of code in that section, we see that we get an estimate for lambda of 90.2, just using the maximum likelihood estimation technique. Now, the lambda parameter can be any positive number. It doesn't just range over a bounded range like P did for the binomial distribution. And so if we're going to construct a prior distribution for our unknown parameter lambda, then we need to choose a distribution that's capable of covering an unbounded range like the positive half real line from zero to infinity. And the gamma distribution can do that. Otherwise, it behaves more or less like a beta distribution. You can choose a target mean and standard deviation and then find parameter values, in this case k and theta, to parameterize your, your beta or your um, gamma distribution so that it takes on the desired mean and standard deviation. So our mean is going to be the maximum likelihood estimate for lambda that we've already come up with. And we're going to specify a standard deviation of 20, uh, just because that's, that's about 20% of the mean value itself. So that, that represents, uh, you know, about steps of about 20 above or below of, uh, of our mean of uh, uncertainty in our, our estimate, just to say that we're not super confident that our estimate is correct at this point. Okay, well the k and theta parameters for the gamma di distribution can be expressed in terms of the mean and standard deviation using the two formulas I've highlighted. So I calculate them accordingly. 
So I'd like to visualize my prior distribution and I'm going to do it by creating a array of possible lambda values. In this case, they're going to range from zero to 150 and I'm just choosing 150 as an upper bound on lambda instead of infinity because it's reasonably far above my mean value of 90.2. Then I'm going to define my prior distribution in terms of the gamma distribution, gamma PDF. I'm going to feed gamma PDF lambda as its random variable and our calculated values of k and theta as the input parameters. And finally I plot lambda as the independent variable uh, with, with the um, prior distribution. So let's see what that looks like. We run that section, and we basically just get a very nice smooth bell-shaped curve with a peak somewhat close to 90. So what we can notice about it is it's a pretty broad bell-shaped curve. So there's a, that reflects the idea that there's a fair amount of uncertainty in our initial estimate for lambda. Now, to refine that, we'll go through and do some map estimation once. So we, we construct a likelihood function and a marginal probability, just as before, and then a posterior probability and plot it. I run that block of code. You can see that the posterior is very much refined compared to the prior probability. Still has the peak in roughly the right spot, 90 something, but it's much more tightly clustered around that peak. And to see where the peak actually falls, we'll do the actual map estimate calculation of finding the maximum point along that graph. So if I run that section, we find that that peak occurs at 90.0084, and we've labeled it accordingly on the graph. Now, like we saw with the binomial distribution, it's certainly possible to go out and collect more data, like this data set here, 94, 74, 89, 83, and 12, 82. Replace the prior with our old posterior that we calculated up here, the tan graph, and then rerun the map estimation algorithm one more time. If we do that, we can see initial prior with our two posteriors, see that that map estimate in this case is, is dropping somewhat. It's down to 87.264, but our confidence in that estimate is increasing because the posterior distributions just keep on getting steeper and narrower as we add more data. And that's what map estimation does for us. One of the primary drawbacks for map estimation, especially for beginners, is that it tends to be viewed as a more complex and advanced technique. After all, it involves the use of calculus, both integration and differentiation, when you're um, having to find marginal probabilities and, and optimize the posterior probabilities in order to find the maxima. It would be nice, though, if you could find a technique that allowed you to take advantage of the corresponding benefits of map estimation without having to deal with its drawbacks. And those benefits are that it allows you to successively learn from data as you collect more data and obtain more and more refined estimates for your unknown parameters. And by refined, I mean not just more accurate, but parameters that you can state in a way that demonstrates a level of confidence that you've got in their correctness. And we saw that when we were doing map estimation because the posterior distributions kept getting steeper and narrower. So that represented a greater and greater degree of certainty that the peaks of those distributions that you were finding were in fact representing the correct probability or the correct parameter value that you were trying to estimate. So that was that, that, that's the reason why you would want to perform map estimation is that it has that flexibility, it has those built-in features. Well, it turns out that there's another technique 
that's closely related to map estimation that retains those features, but it doesn't really require you to have to work with integral or differential calculus, and it's called Bayesian learning. We're going to illustrate Bayesian learning with this initial example. So we're going to suppose that a bird population is made up of birds that suffer from heavy metal contamination and others that don't. Our goal is to estimate the proportion P of the birds that suffer from the contamination. First, we might know nothing about the bird population at all. In this absence of information, we propose a number of possible hypotheses that describe the value of P. And we're going to list off five competing hypotheses in this example. In reality, you'd probably want to do quite a bit more than five, but we'll do five for the sake of being able to follow this, this initial example. The first hypothesis states that P falls somewhere between 0 and 0 0.2. Second hypothesis states that P falls somewhere between 0 0.2 and 0 0.4. Third hypothesis states that P falls somewhere between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. And fourth states that P falls somewhere between 0 0.6 and 0 0.8. And finally, the fifth hypothesis states that P falls between 0 0.8 and 1. So what we've done is we've taken the range of possible values for P, subdivided it into some number, 5 in this case, of evenly sized subintervals. And those are all going to be the possible locations of our true parameter value. Now what we're really doing is we are creeping up on the definition of a discrete prior probability distribution for the location of our unknown parameter p. And there's a lot of ways that we can choose that. We had to get bogged down with things like the beta and gamma distribution when we were doing true map estimation. But here we've, we've got a little bit more flexibility. We can say without any prior information of our bird population, we have no way of determining which of these hypotheses are correct. So the best way that we can, or the best thing that we can do is just assume that any one of the hypotheses is just as likely of being correct as the others. So we're going to say that there, those hypotheses, or P in this case, is distributed uniformly over its range. And so we're going to say that the probability that H1 is true equals the probability that H2 is true. The probability that H3 is true is equal to the probability that H4 is true is equal to the probability that H5 is true. Since there's five of those hypotheses, they're all equally likely at a value of one-fifth or 0 0.2. And we are going to call these probabilities the prior probabilities for the five competing hypotheses. We'll set them all equal. So here's how we'll code that up. Now, before we get to this, we're going to need to have a representative value that we can extract from each of those subintervals that are associated with the five competing hypotheses H1 through H5. And you can really take any point from those subintervals. Uh, we're going to use the midpoints. So if we decide that the true value of P lies somewhere in the H1 interval, we're just going to take P to be 0 0.1, the midpoint. Likewise, 0 0.3 is the midpoint of the H2 interval, and so on. And the prior probabilities for each of those intervals are all 0.2. So we've just specified those using two arrays. We'll run the section to get those stored in the memory. Now that, that's a pretty terrible, we'll scroll up a little bit, that's a pretty terrible way to represent our understanding of what the true probability is. We're basically saying that the true probability could be 0.1, it could be 0.3, it could be 0.5, it could be 0.7, or it could be 0.9, but the probability that those p-values are the correct p-values, they're all equal, we have no way of determining which one is the correct one. It's pretty unsatisfying. So the way that we're going to improve this situation is to collect and analyze some data.
So let's just imagine that we go out on three consecutive days. We're going to capture n equals 20 birds with replacement from our population, and we're going to make note of how many of them showed symptoms of heavy metal contamination. The data we collect takes the following form, d equals 7, 10, and 9. So that's all of the data listed up front. We might not necessarily know that in practice. We might take actually three days and analyze our data results on each day, but in this example I'm just going to write it all down up front and store it into MATLAB's memory. But when I start analyzing my data, I'm going to only work with the first day of data, the seven birds in our sample of 20 that showed contamination signs. So we're going to analyze that first day of data in order to refine our understanding of which hypothesis is the most likely to be correct. The way I'm going to do it is I will compute a likelihood function for my data, a posterior function for my data, a marginal probability, and then a posterior probability. But the nice thing is, is that I've discretized my parameter, p, so that it only takes on these five discrete values, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and 0.9. So I've got a discrete prior and a discrete optimization problem. So when I form my likelihood function, all I've got to do is plug my first data point in, x equals 7, to the binomial distribution. I've already specified that n equals 20, I think, that was my sample size, and then all possible values of p. I multiply those likelihood function values times my prior probability values in order to get a posterior likelihood function. This is the numerator in Bayes' theorem. And then the marginal probability is just going to be the sum of those values. So Bayes' theorem states that you're going to take the posterior likelihood function and divide it by the marginal probability. And that becomes my discrete posterior probability distribution. And had it been the continuous function like we saw in our map examples, we would use calculus to find the location of the peak. But this is just a discrete distribution. It's got five bins to it, so we just have to pick the one with the greatest probability. So let's run that block of code and see what that is. Our posterior probabilities come out to be 0 0.0082, that's associated with the first hypothesis, 0 0.6811, that's associated with the second hypothesis, 0 0.3065, that's associated with the third, 0 0.0042, that's associated with the fourth, and to displayable precision here, 0 0.0000, small probability for the fifth hypothesis. So if we look at this and we can say that we're 68% confident that P lies somewhere between 0.2 and 0.4, and we're distant second place, 30 almost 31% confident that P lies somewhere between 0.4 and 0.6. And if we wanted greater confidence than that, we've got two choices. We can merge those two intervals together and say that 68 plus 30, so almost 99%, um, we could say we're almost 99% confident that P lies somewhere between 0.2 and 0.6, but that's a pretty broad inter interval. So if we want better confidence and better accuracy, we should probably collect some more data. We already know that our second data point is going to be 10, so we'll basically restart the process. We'll update our prior with the posterior probability distribution that we've just collected. That's these values here. We'll compute a new posterior distribution or a new likelihood distribution by taking the one that we had before involving the first day of data and multiplying it by a new binomial distribution applied to the second day's worth of data. Multiply that by the prior in order to get the posterior likelihood function and then sum over all the values in that posterior likelihood function in order to get the marginal probability. And if I divide the posterior likelihood by the marginal probability, according to Bayes' theorem, I get a new posterior distribution. We should see that it is somewhat refined, and it is.
our new posterior distribution. Actually, it's not refined at all because our data has shifted so far to the right. So what we're starting to do is abandon our initial strong belief that P should fall somewhere between 0.2 and 0.4. We're saying, you know, it could be in 0.2 to 0.4, the probability of about 46%, or it could be in the second hypothesis interval, 0.4 to 0.6, with a probability of about 53, maybe 54%. So things look pretty dynamic at this point. We should probably go and analyze our third data point to see if they settle down. So we really repeat the same process over again. Update the prior, compute a new, posterior or a new likelihood function that incorporates the, all three days of data and then posterior likelihood function, a marginal probability, and a posterior probability distribution. Run that section. You can see that our posterior distribution has now shifted its confidence onto the third hypothesis, so the interval 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 instead of the second. And if we were to collect more data, we could maybe see if this process would settle down over, over time. We're not going to do that in this example because we're just trying to illustrate the process. If you were going to do this process for real, you're going to want to analyze quite a bit more data and you're probably going to want to involve quite a few more possible hypotheses for the location of the true parameter. Because here's the thing about this example, we could make up some more data and continue to anal analyze it, and the only thing that we'll ever see improve in this example is the amount of confidence that gets dumped onto one of our intervals. I could imagine if I start adding more data points, this 87.96% probability that says that you know, that's where we think we, th we think P is going to fall somewhere in that third interval from 0.4 to 0.6 with this probability. Maybe that goes up to 90 or 95 or 99 after a few more data points. Well, that's fine. That's a way of saying that we're pretty confident that P lies in that interval, but nothing's going to improve the width of that interval. That interval is still 20 percentage points wide. P lies somewhere between 0 and 40. If I want Bayesian learning to establish estimates that I have greater confidence in than just an interval of 20% width, then I've got to make that decision up front. And I need to choose more than just five hypotheses. Maybe choose 50 or 100, or, you know, whatever it takes to subdivide the range of P from zero to one into fine enough of intervals that I can start collecting data and dumping more and more confidence onto one of those intervals. So I'd never get there with this example because I started out with these five hypotheses that are wide, they're 20 percentage points wide. So that's one of the drawbacks of Bayesian learning is that you've got to manage a lot of data. And if you're going to do it, you probably shouldn't do it with an example, you know, using the architecture of an example like this where we're basically cutting and pasting the same code and rerunning it over and over again. You should try to make efficient use of loops. And we've got an example where we can do that. But before we get there, I want to just remark that there's one additional line of code in this final block that came up with, in a sense, a best estimate. So in one sense, we could say that our best estimate is just the midpoint of the interval that has the highest probability, highest posterior probability attached to it. So that'd be, that'd be um, midpoint of the third interval, 50%. But instead of doing that, what you can also do is compute a weighted average of your 
representative values 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and 0.9 for the five hypothesis intervals. And the weights that you use for that weighted average are going to be the weights from your posterior probability distribution. So if I compute this first value that's close to 0 times 0 0.1 plus this value times 0.2, so 0.1204 times point, not 2, 0.3, and plus 0.8796 times 0.5 plus these two small values times 0.7 and 0.9 respectively, I'm going to get a value of 0 0.4759. So that's my expected, the mathematical expectation, so it's my expected estimate of P based on the data that I've collected so far. So it's just a little under 50%. As I've said, if you're going to use Bayesian learning, you're going to want to apply it to more data than just a set of three data points. And you should probably choose a large enough initial set of hypotheses that it's capable of dividing up the reasonable range of parameter values for the parameter that you're trying to estimate into a fine enough mesh that given enough data you could concentrate confidence probability onto maybe just one or two of the subintervals and say that I'm very confident that the true value of my unknown parameter lies somewhere in this very narrow subinterval. That would be an ideal. And so this example demonstrates how you might be able to go about doing something like that. And in principle, it's, it's very similar to our earlier simple Bayesian learning example. It's just that we have to take a little bit more care to manage and work with our data. So in this example, we're going to illustrate Bayesian learning when the binomial distribution is the model distribution for our larger data set. We're going to simulate the estimation of the unknown parameter p when the value of n is known. So we'll establish our data set. D is equal to this array of all these different values representing the number of preferred outcomes that are observed out of a total of n equals 30 trials. Now, that, that data, it turns out, was just generated using a binomial random number generator calibrated with a true value of p of 0.7111. And normally you're not going to know what the true value is of the parameter that you want to estimate, but we're trying to demonstrate how well Bayesian learning can work, so we want to know that that's the target that we're shooting for. So I've specified that, I'll run this section of code, and that just initializes our data, our number of trials, and then the target value of p that we're trying to estimate. So we're going to divide the range that P could cover, 0 to 1, into 50 intervals instead of, of just 5. And so that what that means is that each interval is 0 0.02 wide. So if we were able to concentrate a large amount of con confidence onto one of those intervals by successively applying Bayesian learning to our data, and that would just be saying that we are very confident that the true value of p lies somewhere in this interval that's only two percentage points wide. It's not bad. You could probably do better. And if you wanted to, you would just increase this number of intervals from 50 to something else, like 100 or 200, you know, whatever it is that uh, is going to meet your needs. The rest of this is just going to be an automated version of what we saw in our simple Bayesian learning example. We're ultimately going to need to have representative values. So we're going to take the midpoints of our intervals. And that's what these two lines of code calculate for us rather than just going through and hard coding them by hand. Then we need to compute a prior probability 
if we're collecting any data, and that prior probability is just going to be a way of saying that I believe that every interval is as likely as the others to contain the true value of p. So we're going, since we've got 50 intervals, we're just going to say that the probability that each interval is the correct interval is, is essentially 1 over 50. And that's what this, this um, line of code is doing, but it's doing it in a general way so that if we use something other than 50 intervals, it'd be correct. Then we create some empty storage arrays for where our overall best estimates are going to be stored after each round of Bayesian learning, where our Bayesian learning estimate is going to be stored, and then also just where a running maximum likelihood estimation is going to, to be stored. So just to review what these are, the best estimate is going to be the expected value of p that we compute at the end of Bayesian learning by taking our prior probabilities, multiplying them by the corresponding um, uh, representative values of p, and then adding those up. The Bayesian learning estimate is just going to be the midpoint of the interval that has the most probability concentrated on it, whereas the maximum likelihood estimate is the maximum likelihood estimate. It's the the peak of the uh, likelihood function that we build as we go. So we'll run that, that code. It's just more initialization code, essentially, until we get down to our actual Bayesian learning algorithm. This is an algorithm that's going to be in a loop that causes us to run the Bayesian learning algorithm on our data, one data point at a time, as we cycle through our data points. So Here's how that's going to work. We form a likelihood function. And the way we're going to form that likelihood function is that initially, we're going before the loop even starts, we're going to say it has a value of 1, which is kind of meaningless, but bear with me to see why that's useful. Because once the loop starts, we're going to multiply that value f that currently contains 1 by the binomial distribution applied to the current data point in our array. First data point, the first time that we go through the loop, the second data point, the second time we go through the loop, and so on. That updates f. So f, the first time the loop runs, f is going to take on the value of this binomial distribution applied to the first data point. But the next time the loop runs, it's going to take that value and multiply it by the binomial distribution applied to the second data point third time it runs, it's going to add or put the third binomial distribution applied to the third data point into that product, and so on. So our likelihood function gets applied to more and more data as the loop continues. Right. Next two lines of code find the maximum likelihood estimate of our data that we've collected so far. These lines of code form the map estimate. This line of code updates, once you found your map estimate, this, it updates your prior probability with the posterior probability. And this line of code finally, well, not highlighting it very well, but this line of code here calculates that, that um, expectation value, the, the best possible estimate of P based on the data so far. And so, this block of code inside of our loop is what's actually running the Bayesian learning algorithm over and over again, and I could stop the loop at this point. But for the sake of illustration, I have several lines of code that's going to plot the way the different types of estimates are behaving as more and more data is, is, is added. So I'm going to be comparing the maximum likelihood estimate to the true value of p that we know but wouldn't normally know, to the map estimate, to the, or not the map estimate, to the Bayesian learning estimate, to the um, best x estimate. So we'll run this section and see what it looks like. You can see, if I scroll down, 
I'll rerun this in a minute, but as I scroll down, we get these two graphs. So this is a histogram of the posterior distribution, and we can see already after 20 or 30 iterations, almost all of the probability is concentrated on this interval that's somewhere here close to 0.7. And then these traces that are shown here show the maximum likelihood estimation function. That's this fairly jagged function bouncing around as it gets fed more and more data. But eventually, out here after 30 some iterations, it settles down pretty close to the true value of p, which is the purple line that's kind of hard to see, but still there. And what we see about Bayesian learning and the expected value of p that's calculated from the Bayesian learning estimates is that both of them asymptotically reach that horizontal line just a little bit earlier than maximum likelihood estimation does. And for the most part in this example, they tend to stay clung to that true value of p line pretty stably. So it's a, it's a much, much less noisy estimation scheme than just ordinary maximum likelihood estimation tends to be. That's one of the nicer features of it. So just so that we can see it run again, I'm going to clear MATLAB's memory and rerun our entire script. We can see now how that posterior distribution started out as a fairly nice bell curve and then quickly got very tall and narrow, demonstrating that as we added more data, each iteration corresponds to the addition corresponds to the addition of one new data point, then we get more confidence built onto the interval that contains the correct value of p. Thank you for watching this technological companion on map estimation and Bayesian learning. I hope you found it helpful. Be sure to join us for our next video lesson on hypothesis testing.